I don't speak clearly, if I don't remember to enunciate my words, um, if I'm saying something that doesn't make sense, and if you have any questions in general, please stop and ask. There will be time at the end for questions, I hope. Um, but I'm a big fan of interrupt-driven uh, talks. Um, this isn't going to go very deep into anything. It's not a high, it's not a really low-level sort of talk. But if there's anything that doesn't, it's not clear to you. It's probably not clear to other people too. So do them a favor of being the bold one who says stop and wait and explain that. Um, okay. So Grail's plugin best practices. So this is really sort of a brain dump for me. A bunch of random kind of topics, um, thoughts in general about creating plugins in Grails. So um, I've done a lot of them. Um, that's the first page and that's the second page. There's 60 to in total in the list. Um, so unfortunately, they don't give awards for this sort of thing, but that is the largest number. I have the most plugins available. Um, to me, I probably have the most open Jira issues of any developer in Rails. Um, <coughs> So um, basically having written a lot of these and then also having um, done a lot of pull requests for new plugins, and I'll talk about that in a bit, um, the sort of patterns that have emerged that I'd like to kind of share with you guys. So, but first let's, let's talk kind of about, um, you know, what is, a, what is a plugin in general? What is a plugin in Grails? So there is sort of an accepted standard definition from the Wikipedia. Um, basically plugs into, adds on to uh, some larger system and adds behavior, or changes behavior, that sort of thing. Um, so mechanically in Grails, um, plugins are, are nearly identical to Grails applications, right? So there's really um, two primary differences as far as the files go. As far as usage goes, it's radically different. But as far as the files go, when you say Grails create app, app name or create plugin plugin name. Uh, the only difference is that the plugin has a plugin descriptor and it has three scripts. It also won't have, especially in the newer versions of Grails, um, all of the CSS and images and JavaScript and stuff it used to. I pulled that out because I, you know, it, it, usually that doesn't make sense. Um, and in fact, um, converting a, an application to a plugin is pretty much as simple as um, adding in a plugin descriptor. You can manually create that. Um, so if you had a, a, an application that was primarily something that could be shared, except for maybe a few things that are really specific to the app, um, you could refactor it into a separate project. You could also just literally convert it to a plugin in place. Um, so the standard procedure for creating a plugin is just like creating an application. You use the great create plugin script. Uh, creates an empty bare bones plugin application and, and there you go. So um, here's sort of a mechanical uh, a look at the, the, the difference and it's it scales a little bit differently because of the way the images look but really it's, it's nearly identical. The, the big difference being um, the plugin descriptor and those three scripts which are empty and you can even del you can delete those if you, if you didn't need them. Um, so there are these extension points. You, you, a plugin usually adds in some behavior, right? So what do you do? You add to the build system. You add in scripts. So if you look at the, um, the uh, good lord, the uh, database refactoring plugin, the <laughs> um, lookbase plugin, right? The, um, that adds in like 30 scripts, right? Uh, the Spring Security plugin adds in some scripts to create the domain classes. Um, so adding in Gantt scripts, although you can, add, you can create those in an application, uh, it's much more common to see those added um, from, from a plugin. Um, you can create beans. That's something that's commonly done. If you look at the Spring Security core plugin, it's something like 60 or 70 or 50 Spring beans that are created. Most of them are the same ones that would have been created in a non-Grails uh, Java-based Spring application. Um, and then a few of them are plugin specific. Um, there's a, a hook for uh, adding in meta-class behavior uh, conveniently. 
um, watching files editing, uh, being edited. So uh, in 2.0, of course, the file reloading mechanism changed quite a bit. But independent of how that's done, uh, it still may be the case in development mode that if, so if the developer changes something that your plugin read at startup, it's probably going to want to reconfigure itself based on that change. So again, for the Spring Security Core plugin, you can annotate controllers with at secured, right? And you can say which roles are required for which controllers. And if you change that at runtime in run app, then you would hope that the plugin would reread that information and rebuild the, the mappings, the internal memory representation of those mappings. And that's exactly what it does. Um, so if you support any sort of uh, configuration um, that's done at startup that can be changed uh, during development mode, then you should uh, set up the auto reloading. You can also, and this isn't done in many plugins, but it's, it's nice to be able to do this. It's very easy to uh, edit the web XML and add in filters, servlets, that sort of thing. Um, and you can even add in new artifacts. And again, that's something that's it's a bit rare. Not many plugins do that. Um, one of the first ones that did that is the uh, Quartz plugin. So there's a job artifact. So it's very easy, rather than going to the native Quartz API, which you can still do, of course, um, rather than having to do that, you can li literally just create a Groovy class in the right standard thing for any, any, any artifact, right? So artifacts and grails are typically have a naming convention and they have a folder that they go and then you set some properties and magic happens and all kinds of great things happen. So same thing with a job class. Um, the plugin registers a job artifact handler, looks for uh, classes in the jobs directory under grails app. If it finds them, it automatically wires them up and you can easily do that if you uh, register a new artifact handler. Um, so just a sort of a quick run through of, of, in my mind, the sort of general categories of, of what types of plugins are there. So um, this is kind of a, I stole the slide from an old uh, presentation. So the data sources plugin doesn't make much sense anymore because multiple database support has been added to um, Grails core. But at the time, that was something that Grails didn't have. So that plugin added in something that wasn't there. UI performance, again, that's a kind of a dead plugin because everyone's using resources plugin. But it added something that Grails Core didn't have. It added compression, gzipping, uh, expires headers, all the stuff that resources does. Um, another one is a, a wrapper type of a plugin that uh, hook, it wires up a, a cool, hopefully useful uh, framework or, or, or uh, library into Grails, like Spring Security, um, Searchable, which added support for uh, Compass, which is going to give you um, uh, Lucene index for your domain classes. Um, UI only plugins that just add in controllers or uh, maybe look and feel sort of thing. Uh, Luke Daly for a while was on this uh, kick where he created bug fix plugins that actually instead of having a minimum Grails version had a maximum Grails version because he would fix the bug in Grails and he would say that this plugin is good until this version of Grails at which point it's no longer valid, you don't need it anymore. Um, and then plugins that just add resources. Uh, which actually now is a bit more common because with the resources plugin having a pipeline, um, the jQuery plugin, um, a whole bunch of plugins out there that add in resources in a really intelligent way that can then hook into that resources pipeline. Um, so those plugins don't really do anything, right? They just add in uh, the CSS, JavaScript, and or images so that you download them once, you cache them in your Ivy cache, and then you just keep adding it to every application. Um, there's probably more categories than that, but that's, in my mind, sort of a general uh, delineation. Um, all right, so marketing stuff. Uh, so here's a really simple example. Um, this isn't actually valid anymore because this isn't how we do it, but this is sort of a, a, a stripped down version of a, a real core of Rails plugin. So there used to be a, there still is a logging plugin, but it doesn't hardly do anything anymore. Uh, what it used to do is, in its do with dynamic methods callback, which is one of the plugin descriptor uh, closures, it would loop through all of the classes in the application, um, and those are not source, ju source Java and source Groovy classes, but all artifact classes, and it would add in a, a meta class method to get the logger. So you always had inside of your controller services, domain classes, tag libs, there's always a log field. You can always say log.debug, log.error. You don't have to wire that up into log4j or slf4j or anything like that. Of course, now that's all done inside of the AST and it's in the bytecode. Um, 
But this is still, I think, an interesting example of a small plugin that adds in some behavior, and it's, it's as simple as that. So there are more attributes required than just those two, um, but those are sort of the, 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 the important ones. The version of the plugin, so that when you have a new version, you, know, there's, you can know which one you're installing. And then also defining which version of Grails your application works on. Um, I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to blast through these a bit quickly. All right, so um, one thing I've struggled with, and I go back and forth, uh, and I'll go back again to um, the Spring Security plugins. So when you install the Spring Security plugin, the first thing you have to do is you run, you run the S2 Quick Start script. And so that's supposed to, in one step, kind of give you everything you need to get going. Um, and in theory, at least at the time, this is going to change in the new ver in the in the 2.0 version of the plugin. But I didn't want to make a lot of decisions for you about you know where the packages are and where the files are and everything. So um, you get to tell me what's the name of the class and wh what package is it in, and it would create the the, the login logout controllers, a couple of GSPs and two or three or four domain classes, depending on how things go. Um, so there's a design decision there of, do I put that in the plugin, or do I generate it into your application? Now, if I put it in the plugin, then I can kind of control adding in new behavior, fixing issues, that sort of thing. But if I generate it into your app, now I've got this weird problem of, I don't want to edit your code. I don't want to try to, because it's groovy, right? It's hard enough with Java, but um, you know the install plugin stuff. You know we struggled with that, um, and we don't want to edit build config manually. So we've deprecated and removed install plugin, uh, but we don't want to try to edit build config .ruby because it could have arbitrarily complex code in there, and we don't want to have to deal with that. So I don't know if I want to deal with editing your application code to upgrade the application to use the latest version. So you've got to then decide, you know, which approach do I take? Do I generate code and then get stuck with possibly old code that doesn't have all the new features and then people are reporting bugs that are really their fault because they're not regenerating the code? I can't regenerate it because you might have edited it and added in behavior, right? I mean, see what I mean? So, and I did this for the ACL plugin because there's the um, domain classes for storing all the ACL data in the database. And then it kind of became apparent at that point that that's ne almost never going to change. So let's put that in the plugin. Let's leave it in the plugin. But now you're kind of stuck, aren't you? Because what if you do want to make a change? One of the things you might want to do is you might want to add in uh, second level uh, hibernate caching. Maybe uh, the, this, the defaults that I had um, don't make sense. Now should I then have to set up that as properties and allow you to change those properties? It gets really messy. Jumping ahead a little bit, I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail. It turns out that your best bet is to leave all the code in the plugin because you can override every class in a plugin. If you have, and this is separate from what Grail, uh, Graham was talking about with namespaces, because that really is talking about two different plugins that have, two diff that have the same controller name, the same domain class name. What I'm talking about is a plugin that, generate, that has a, a, a resource, a, an artifact or a GSP, um, and overriding it in the, in the application. It turns out that if you have a controller in a package in the plugin, and you have a controller in the same package with the same name in the application, the one in the application wins. Magic, right? It's not magic, all it does is Grails compiles the plugins first, and then it compiles your application. So they just overwrite those class files. So I can then, as a plugin developer, have the code in the plugin upgrade it as we, as we need, and then you can override anything you want. Not just uh, artifacts, but actual classes in source Groovy, source Java. Um, so I'll talk about that a little bit later in because uh, I want to th think about the ideas of designing for extensions and designing to be overridden and designing to not be overly inflexible. So um, And then one thing that, that I, I think is kind of interesting, um, down at the bottom there, um, let's say you have a plugin, for example, Searchable, that has a controller that allows, renders a UI that allows you to type in Lucene qu queries into your, uh, into your Lucene index. It's pretty cool, right? You want that in production? 
sure don't. Um, so, and you can't just trust that because it's not listed as a link on, on a page somewhere that no one's going to find it. Because if I know it's a Grails app and I get some sort of a hint that you're using Searchable, because that you know you might have a search page, a, a different search page, um, I might decide to go in there, and then go around your search and do, do a direct search. And that's just one example. There's other um, cases where a plugin can contribute um, a UI element, a controller, that you don't want in production. Now, of course, you can guard that with security. But one thing I would prefer to do is to unmap it. And we don't really have a mechanism for doing that in URL mappings. But what you can do is you can set up a URL mapping. I don't know how clear this will be, but you can, like, you could reroute the console plugin under the admin slash console URI if you had the console uh, plugin installed. Um, and then, and, and then override the default behavior of rendering the console um, controller, send it to a, an errors controller that uh, sends a 404. Now it's not there anymore, right? It's there. Uh, something happens at the server when you hit that. But um, what I've done is I create a controller that has a, an action name called URL mapping. And it's the same action as a 404 handler, except it logs an error saying someone tried to use the one that they weren't supposed to see. So it's sort of a hacker thing. But it still sends a 404 so that no one can see it. So there are ways to unmap, um, to take away uh, behavior. And maybe as part of 2.3, maybe if one of you were to write up a JIRA for this, we might uh, add in an ability to unmap um, URIs. And that's assuming that you're using that catch-all, right, there's the the, you know, when you create in, in the default URL mappings, there's the catch-all controller action ID thing, right? Um, so if that's there, then everything gets automatically mapped for you. Um, so let me see who's going to create that Jira. You all are cowards. Um, okay. Let me talk about the plugin descriptor itself. So a plugin has two primary sections, right? There are, there's the top section with all the fields. So it's going to have uh, version, Grails version, uh, plugin excludes, depends on, that sort of stuff. And in later versions, you, you have to specify, it says that they're optional, but now they're mandatory. The license, the um, SCM location, all that sort of stuff. Um, we now have a fairly rigorous uh, uh, release process where you cannot uh, release a new plugin unless we've authorized it. And we're not going to authorize it unless you tell us where, where the bug reporting system is, where's the source code, what's your license, that sort of thing. And then in the second, the second section is all those closures. Do with web descriptor, do with spring, do with application context, do with dynamic methods, and on change. So those are really the hooks for doing stuff to add in the behavior. So if you need to edit, add in behavior inside of WebXML, you do that in do with web descriptor you're given the node object for the root node of the DOM, which you can use this really cryptic, strange DSL to, to add in. You know, it's, it's hard to use, but you, know, you just copy paste. Um, and you can easily add in filters and servlets and wh whatever right into the web XML. Do a spring is where you do all the work to add in beans, uh, register spring beans. Do with application context is called after the entire application context is wired up. Um, so all the beans are ready to be used, and if, you, if there's anything you need to do after everything's wired together and beans are available, you can do that there. Do with dynamic methods really could be, that work could be done in do with application context because it's really the same phase of startup. Um, and then you're actually passed in the application context in case you, you need to, to get access to spring beans. But it's kind of nice to have that separated out, sort of be more clear about what you're doing. And that's where you can do all the work to add in metaclass behavior, um, adding in dynamic uh, behavior to controllers, services, uh, whatever. Um, and then on change is where you will handle those events that um, happen based on changes that were made for artifacts that you were listening to changes for, right? So in the, again, in the Spring Security plugin, I look for changes in controllers. So every time you edit a controller, and that gets recompiled, I'm going to get an event passed to my own change, and I can then handle that. I can look and see what happened and make a decision on what do I have to do based on what happened. Um, and there's also on config change. So if, you, if there's something in the config that you want to watch for changes of, then you can, um, you can handle that. So that's pretty cool stuff because um, you have a lot of, it's a lot of 
hooks in there. A lot of ways you can get inside of the application and add in stuff and change stuff around. And I probably should have asked this at the beginning. How many people, how many of you guys here have created a plugin that you're actually using, either released officially or internally? Okay. So a lot of the stuff you, you guys have seen. Um, here's a quick example of using the uh, Spring DSL to create a Spring Bean. That's pretty standard stuff. That's really well documented in the Grails doc, so I'm not going to spend much time on that. Um, all right, so I'm really kind of blasting through this. Any questions so far? I asked you guys to interrupt, and you can still plan to do that. But. All right. All right, so planning for customization. So it's hard to predict the future, right? Um, I do a talk on, on general, not just spring security, but security in general. And one of the things I started to put in the slides is you want to try to think like a hacker. Then I realized, well, that's really stupid. Because unless you are a hacker, and some of you probably are, um, it's next to impossible to sort of put yourself in their shoes. Um, I heard earlier some, some disparaging um, uh, remarks towards QA people, how they tend to be sort of junior developers. Sometimes QA people like doing QA. They're good at it, right? I, I've worked with some really terrible QA people, and I've worked with, with some amazing QA people who just find <coughs> issues that I never in a my million years would have discovered on my own. And um, so if, if you were to try to say to your, your development team, all right, let's take some of the burden off the QA guys. Let's try to think like QA. Well, you really can't, because that's a mindset that a lot of us don't have. I don't think like QA. I want you to use my software the way I wrote it. Not the way you want to use it. I want you to use it my way. And of course, that's unreason unreasonable. So, but I can't think like a QA person, so I'm kind of stuck with bug reports. That's the life we live. So coming back from my rant, um, it's hard to predict how people are going to use your plugin, and it's hard to set it up in a way that's going to be easy to customize and easy to work with. But let's think about some ideas for what you might do. So as I said before, plugins are compiled first and then the application. So that means that you have a little bit of flexibility there in that you don't have to make the, your plugin quite as configurable as the Spring Security Core plugin is, right? Have you guys seen that? I might have gone a little bit overboard, but it's, it's pretty insanely configurable. Um, instead of using the namespace support that Spring has, I actually create every single bean explicitly inside of the, the plugin. So that means that every bean can be overridden by, re by taking that bean definition, copying it into your resources.ruby, and changing it. And then yours wins because resources.ruby gets loaded after the plugins get loaded. Um, so if there were some magic, if there were an XML node that built 15 uh, beans, you wouldn't have that flexibility. But because I went through the work of splitting out all those 15 beans and creating them explicitly, now you can override every one of them. And, and uh, a lot of times, a uh, Spring class will create a default implementation of, a, of, a, of something that can be overridden and then have a setter for it. I pull that default out as its own beam so that you can override that too. And then any setters that are uh, regular values, non-object uh, setters, so any setters that are strings or booleans or things like that, I pull those out uh, into, as properties. So you don't have to override a beam to change one property of a beam. You can just change that property. So that's me sort of being insanely customizable. Um, I probably could do a lot less of that because of the way that, that the things actually work. Um, so um, we just keep that in mind that you don't necessarily need to worry too much about um, overriding, especially knowing th about that rule about the, the, the compilation order. Okay. So one thing that we do in, in Grails a lot that I'd like to get away from, it's, it's these next two, uh, next two nodes. Um, don't create a new instance of an object. Create a spring bean for it. Even if it doesn't really have any dependencies, if, even if, if it really isn't a candidate for being a spring bean, it's a lot easier for, to override it if it's a spring bean than if you create it as a new whatever inside of the code, right? How are you going to override that behavior? You're not without using meta class override, you know, the meta, and you can't use the meta class inside of a Java class, right? So that's not going to help you there. So you almost need AOP to kind of sneak in there and change it. Um, 
But if it's a Spring Bean, then I can do whatever I want in my application to override your initial design decision in the plugin. Same thing, and this is probably a little overkill, but don't necessarily create a new class instance, but set the name somewhere as a configurable property and create a new instance of that by reflection. That's going, again, that's, that's maybe a little extreme. I think that makes more sense in Grails than inside of a plugin. Um, but avoid using new, I think, is the, the takeaway from those two bullet points. Um, make it easier for the application that's using your plugin to change that thing. Along those same lines, don't make your methods private. Now in Groovy, that's not that big of a deal, um, but I'm going to make a radical suggestion a little bit later that I guess I'm going to make now, which is that I think you should use Java instead of Groovy in your plugins. And this is a Groovy conference, and you know, I'm sensing you guys wish, are wishing you had some rotten fruit to throw at me right now. Um, I am a recovering Java developer. Sometimes I slip. Um, I think that uh, plugins, especially a plugin where something is called a lot, um, if you don't have the luxury of being able to use Groovy 2.2, Spring 2.2, Groovy 2, you can't um, use compile static, then the next best thing is writing your code in Java. So if your code paths inside of your plugin aren't really expensive, if they don't get hit a lot, then Groovy's fine. But if you're writing a filter that gets hit for every request, um, like the resources plugin, you know, it's pretty cool, but it's slower than it should be because it's entirely written in, in Groovy. Uh, I've looked at that code and, and I think a lot of it could be rewritten in Java, you know, and it would be basically the same code. Um, anything that's really dynamic, you, you, should, you should keep it in Groovy. Um, but that filter fires for every single request. And that Groovy overhead, it's small, but it adds up, right? So um, whether it's Groovy or Java, prefer protected to private. And don't use static unless you have to, because you can't override a static method in Java, right? That just doesn't work. Um, so if it's an instance method and it's protected, then I can subclass your class, use it instead, and uh, use my version of that method instead of yours. But if it's private, and if the or if a variable is private and it's not uh, changeable, then I've got to either, either use reflection or I've got to use Groovy if I'm lucky. And um, another thing that I've seen a lot is in those um, plugin callbacks, right? So in do with Spring, do with application context, there can be a tremendous amount of logic there. Huge numbers of Spring beans. The do with application context can be really, really busy. Um, that's hard to test, right? You want to test your plugins. But if you, all of your code is inside of the plugin descriptor, it's pretty hard to create a new instance of that and then call it, right? You can do it, but it's not it's anything that's pleasant. Um, so what you want to do instead is have your plugin descriptor call one or more classes in your application. Then you can test that. Maybe that's not testable, but it's your plugin, so you probably should test it. But then it also makes it easier for me as the application user of your plugin to change that behavior because instead of being hidden inside of the plugin descriptor, which is almost impossible to, to change, now it's in a regular old class with protected methods and public methods and uh, all of that. So avoid putting everything right inside of the, the, the plugin descriptor. Some plugins are pretty much just a wrapper around the plugin descriptor, um, and unnecessarily so. Um, so I've talked about this a little bit. So, so more formally, um, remember what Graham was saying last talk about how if two plugins have the same, create the same bean name, um, whichever one is loaded last wins. And if that's random, then that's bad. Um, but you can, you can declare that my plugin loads after this other plugin and define the bean order. So for example, the Spring Security OpenID plugin defines itself to load after the Spring Security Core plugin because it redefines the user detail service to be one that can uh, either load from the database or from an OpenID request. Um, and the, the, the core plugin's uh, implementation only knows about going to the database. Um, further, you can take advantage of the fact that resources.groovy is loaded after all the plugins are loaded. So you can then redefine it again um, to do whatever you want. And that's probably the most common uh, change that people make in the Spring Security plugin. 
is redefining the user detail service because Spring Security does not care where your authentication data comes from. All it needs is a username, a password, not always a password, and then some role names and whether you're enabled, right? I mean, just six bits of information. Uh, and from that, it builds a, a little POJO, and then that's used as part of your authentication object. It doesn't care where that comes from. Um, it can, it's typically from a database, but it could be from a web service request, it could be from OpenID, it could be from Facebook, it could be from anywhere, it could be from LDAP, whatever. So since that's a, there's a whole chapter in the Spring Security plugin uh, documentation on redefining this beam. Uh, so I think that's a good example of, of, of this. So remember that, that the plugins load in whatever order they're defined in, and you can use load after and load before to, to kind of customize that. Um, Resources.ruby resources loads last. And these, these beans basically act like a map. And in fact, they're actually stored inside of a map. So the key for the user detail service, uh, w when this DSL fires, it's going to build up a little object that's later going to be used to actually build up the application context all these little bean definition objects. Um, those are stored in a map. So if later in the chain, a new one with the same key is, is seen, it's just going to override the old one. It's just going to do a map.put. And if there was one already there, it, it's gone now. So a lot of, lot of flexibility there. And uh, I get a little more excited about this than I probably should. But I freaking love bean post-processor, bean factory post-processor, bean definition registry post-processor, not because they're insanely long bean names, class names. Um, these give a control freak like me unbelievable power. You can do anything you want. The bean post-processor is the simplest one. It allows you to um, completely replace whole beans, wrap them inside of proxies, do all kinds of cool stuff. The bean factory post-processor and, and bean definition registry post-processor allow you to create whole beans from, from, from scratch. Um, or just change individual properties or do whatever you want. So the, the most common, the, the biggest use of this so far that I've done is in the uh, Cloud Foundry and Heroku plugins. So they have a, a shared uh, cloud support plugin where a lot of the work is done. But they, since both environments, they're, they're very different, but they, they both use the same approach of when you deploy your application into their production uh, system. There are environment variables that have the information for uh, what are the URLs and username and password and sort of stuff for connecting to Mongo and Redis and your MySQL database, your Postgres database, whatever. So rather than coupling your application to Cloud Foundry or to Heroku or to whatever, um, you can pretty much leave your production values the default values. Um, and I will go in using one of these post processors and I will find the new URLs and rebuild them. Uh, on the fly and connect your application to that thing. And another thing that I can do is I can even use some intelligence. So in the, mice, in the, in the JDBC URL, if you're using a, a relational database, you can have, uh, you know, you've got the, like in MySQL, right? It's JDBC colon MySQL slash whatever, database name colon 3306. And you can have a question mark. You can have a query string, right? You can define stuff like um, UTF-8 and uh, a bunch of parameters. You can pass in data to the driver. You've probably seen this. So I actually take that string, if it's there, I rebuild the stuff to the left of it using the, the environment, and then I add in your string back again. So if you told me in the, in, inside of the section where you didn't know what the connection information was, that you want to use UTF-8, you're still going to use it. So, and all this is, is possible because I can sneak in there with this standard thing um, and rewire, I, I can see, I can see, check that you're in Heroku or you're in Cloud Foundry. I can see that you've got a data source registered. I can see that you've got these values in, in the uh, environment. Plug it all together. If any of those conditions isn't met, then I just don't do anything. It's, a, it's just a pr pretty cool um, how much control you have over that. And all you do is you just create a, a class that implements one of these interfaces, register it as a bean with any name. The name doesn't matter. And Spring will find all these uh, post processors. We'll pull them out first. So as it's reading the, the context, as it's building up the context, it searches for all these post processors first, pulls them out of the way, and then starts building the beans and then calls all the post processors, post processors to do all this work. Pretty slick stuff. All right. So there's that weird syntax for adding in elements to the web XML. It's, it's really strange. So you use an XPath expression to find where you're gonna start putting stuff. So this is going to find the, uh, the, the first context param 
element. Um, and then you want to, in this case, I want to go uh, after all the context params. So I'm going to go to the end. Um, and then I'm going to plus in a closure, which will create a filter with these, and then it'll create two child nodes. And um, it's, a, it's a really weird syntax, and, and the first few times you use it, it's really uh, confusing, but um, then you just copy paste. Steal from mine. I've, you can look at the Spring Security plugins and see a lot of examples of these. Um, one pet peeve of mine. Um, so I've got about 175 GitHub repositories. And a whole bunch of those are pull requests, forks of plugins that I sent pull requests to because we get, you know, I said before that the process has changed. So in order to, to release a new plugin, you have to send us a request, you have to point us at the source, and we're going to do a little code review. Um, and that's kind of become my job. So um, basically, if you, if you submit a, a plugin request, you're going to get forked. Um, and I'm going to do some cleanup, usually. Um, and one of the things that, that I see a lot is you create a plugin with Grails 2.2, and it'll set the minimum version to Grails 2.2. But usually, you didn't do anything that required 2.2 or 2.3 or 2.1 or anything. So I'll usually bump that down to 2.0. If you, and you can bring that back up again. But keep in mind that um, it's going to default to the version that you're using. So you're artificially, if you leave that at 2.2, you're artificially restricting who can use your plugin. That's good, because the fewer users you have, the fewer bugs you're going to have reported against your plugin. Um, fewer complaints. Uh, but you probably want people to actually use your plugin. So um, drop that down to 1.3 if, if you, if you want to support 1.3. Um, but of course, if you use anything that requires a particular version of Grails, then of course, use that real version. Um, you guys probably know about uh, buildconfig.groovy. It's, it's pretty cool. You can do a lot of um, high-end stuff there. And now, of course, we don't use install plugin anymore, right? Nobody uses install plugin because it's deprecated. Have you seen it? I don't know if you guys have played with 2.3, but it's actually gone in 2.3. Well, it's not gone. Install plugin now just prints out the code that you should copy and paste into build config. Uh, and an uninstall plugin says, nope, I don't know what to do. I can't uninstall the plugin. Delete that from your build config. Uh, so we no longer edit application.properties. Um, and that, that's completely gone. So get in the habit of not using install plugin. Um, put your dependencies inside of the build config. Um, exclude them from being shared into the containing application with export equals false, if that makes sense. If you need Hibernate locally for testing, uh, but it's not a dependency at runtime, then don't export it. This is the standard syntax for the release plugin. Please be sure to remember to set the dependency for the REST client builder. This is, a, this is a, an annoying bug in Grails that um, I th I'm pretty sure is still broken. Um, you can exclude the release plugin, just like I did with the Hibernate plugin, but it won't exclude the, that plugin's dependencies. So this will leak into the plugin. If you guys have seen, uh, you probably have the SVN plugin in, in, in your, some of your applications that came from nowhere. Where did this thing come from? It came from an older version of the release plugin that used to depend on the SVN plugin. And the, the developer didn't properly ex exclude that. So if you set up an explicit dependency on the dependency, the, the transitive dependency of the release plugin, and also export that, then it will be excluded. So just copy and paste this in every build config for all your plugins and you'll be set. And of course, if you don't release them to the public, then you don't really care about this stuff. This is really more important for plugins that, you're, that are going to the, to the portal. Um, if you do have dependency management issues, and this is really pre-Ether, this is for Ivy, um, you can, um, I did a blog post on how to visualize the, um, the uh, dependency graph. And you can also uh, change the logging for um, build config because it defaults to warn, but you can crank, you can make it really noisy with info verbose or debug, and you can actually see all the ID Maven noise that's happening to figure out when weird things happen. Why are those weird things happening? Um, Um, if you do write scripts, you should probably write tests for them. Um, as of quite a while ago now, um, there is an abstract CLI test case class that you can extend. And what it does is it will actually create, it will actually start up Grails. Right? It'll st it, so these things run really, really, really slowly. Um, 
Um, but that's what you need to do. When you, in order to test a script, you actually need to run Grails and run that script and then pass it some arguments or do whatever and then uh, inspect what happened and see if it did the right thing. So um, there is this infrastructure to do that. And it's got nice behaviors like it'll have a timeout, so it won't just sit there and wait forever. Um, so if you accidentally have it set up so it asks you a question, yes or no, and, and you're not there to answer the question because it's running inside of a VM that you can't see, it's not going to sit there forever. It'll time out after two minutes or whatever, and you can configure that. So um, I talked a lot about this in, in, in the book in the plugin section, so um, I won't spend a lot of time on that here. Um, all right, so I'm running out of time. So I want to talk about one th my general approach for testing plugins. I mean, I'm talking about just sort of click testing, not automated testing, but you know, using the plugin and seeing if, seeing if it works. So basically, my general workflow is create the plugin and write as much code as I can uh, outside of an application. But at some point, I need to see this working, right? So I need to install it into the application. A lot of people use inline plugins. I do not like in, uh, inline plugins for a lot of reasons. The biggest one is that there are some things that just don't work or don't work correctly. That's frustrating enough to me that I'm, I, I'm, I'm like, all right, forget it. I'm not going to use it then. So then I'm stuck with installing it into the application. But I'm going to tend to want to edit the installed plugin's code to change the behavior, right? Now I'm out of sync. Now I've got um, the official code that in my you know, Git controlled or SVN controlled, whatever, source controlled plugin. And I've got the, the new stuff, which should um, in, uh, as part of the application's uh, install plugin. So how do I sync those up? So I'm not going to do a whole um, demo of this, but I found this really cool tool called Meld. It's a Python app. It's open source. It runs in Windows, Mac OS, Linux. Um, and so what I do is I, I literally do a directory diff. It'll do a file diff. It'll do three ways. It'll, it does everything you want. So here's where the plugin is, is, is installed. Here's the actual plugin code itself. I, could, I can diff those two, and I can just step through. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't get installed, right? So settings is only in the project. Um, docs don't get copied over. Um, docs don't get copied over. The target directory is in there. The test directory is in there. So I can skip stuff. And then I can see that these are different, or well, they're not even there, right? Or this is a new file that I've added. Um, and I can, um, I don't have any, well, here. so now I can do a line by line copy. I can, I can copy over all those changes. So this is my work, this is what I do for every plugin. This is, this works for me. So I just periodically, as I make changes in the install application code, I just move it over. And sometimes I make changes in the actual code, then I have to copy that into the, the app. Either way, I can do um, whatever I need to do. That makes sense. Um, I don't know if, Maybe we'll talk afterwards, um, but that's for me, having done this a lot, the only way that I can really do this, I can, you know, w without using, without inline plugin feature being fixed, and that would be the ideal, this workflow works great for me. So I'm actually, I'm going to do a, I haven't done this yet, but I'm going to do a, a little screencast with a real demo of, of actually doing this live, kind of clarify those ideas. Because um, I think, I think that, that really makes sense. Um, so testing in general, of course, test your apps, right? Use unit tests, use integration tests. Um, test your scripts because you can. Um, I also write scripts, bash scripts, that programmatically create test applications that I then install the plugin into and run. So the, the Spring Security plugins, security, I think, is really important. So every release I do, I create all these test apps, because there's way too much to do uh, manually. And, and all these have to be functional tests, right? I can't do integration tests for security, because I need a real server running. I need real requests. I need filters. I need all that stuff. But I can't change the uh, security mechanism from annotations to um, database request maps uh, at runtime. So I have to create two different applications uh, to test those two different things. So I have all these different combinations. Um, and that's a blog post that I still have got to write, which is basically a, a kind of a workflow for how to programmatically build up and modify uh, applications. And if you want, just take a look at the scripts that I, this, this is all in source control. Um, not really written to be shared, not really written, this is written for me, not for you, but please feel free to steal it. Um, 
Another thing that I, I recently discovered um, is um, CloudBees Build Hive, and this isn't the only one out there, but I don't know why, but this is free. Um, I guess it's to kind of get you excited about CloudBees and then you pay money at CloudBees, but Build Hive is really amazing because it's, it's basically all these Jenkins servers where you point it at GitHub. I assume it supports other stuff than GitHub, but that's, that's what I use. And it'll run your tests for you. This is awesome. So, um, so I have one of them out there, um, more of as a, as a proof of concept. Um, but I'm going to do this for all my plugins. This is freaking awesome. And it's, it's got the, this little icon that you can put on your like uh, on a web page, so it'll give you a status report. For, you know, is, is the build passing or build failing? And just like any Jenkins Hudson, it'll send you emails when it fails. And so basically, every time I check in code to this project, it fires off a build and runs it for free. I don't have to have the hardware. I don't have to pay for anything. It's super awesome. So um, continuous testing, continuous integration. I mean, you do it for apps, might as well do it for your plugins. And of course, if you've already got this set up for your other stuff, then you should do it for your plugins too, but this is pretty cool. Um, so in general, to create a plugin, um, create an account at Grails.org. Grails we don't talk about this much, but I think you should probably ask other people about this. Does this make sense? Is there something already out there that does this, right? We get a, a handful of those every so often of, Someone tries to change something, create a whole new plugin that does something very slightly different from an existing plugin, and the pushback is going to be, of course, why don't you talk to the other developer and you know, kind of work together instead of having two nearly identical plugins? Submit the, the request. I will then see it, and I will fork it, and I will clean it up for you and send it back. Um, and then you publish it, and then profit. Right? We're all getting rich on plugins, right? Nope. Um, all right, and then also it's really easy to set up uh, an Artifactory server locally. So that's another option too. You could keep you could, you could keep pushing uh, snapshot builds of your plugin to Artifactory and then um, install it from there. That's another option for, instead of the, the diff approach that I was talking about. Um, all right, I'm out of time, so I will put this up on SlideShare. I will tweet or blog about the location of this. Um, Yeah, and one thing, this is more for public plugins than for private ones. But um, run package plugin and actually look at the contents of the zip file. Make sure that, that there's not stuff in there that you didn't mean, there for, there, didn't mean for there to be. It's easy to, to exclude stuff from the, from the zip file. Um, all right, and if you want to learn more, I wrote a book. Um, you guys all already own a copy of this, right, though? Um, <laughs> All right, thank you. Do we have any quick questions? We can run over a little bit. Yeah. Uh, have you looked at using Travis CI instead of Cloudbees? Uh, that's the other one I think that I talk about in the book, Travis CI. Um, I didn't use it. I just used uh, Cloudbees more as a proof of concept to, to kind of do it for myself. Um, is it better? The only difference is it plugs into the API so it can approve pull requests, and it will run the tests on the pull request and like give you a little green bar. I huh. know uh, the CloudBees will just kind of comment on pull requests and say it's good or not, but it won't actually use the you know API. Cool. Anything else? Yes. Um, so binary plugins, um, there are not many benefits. Um, it's a different class loader, so you get some benefits, some weirdnesses there. I think the primary motivation for, for us creating binary plugins was to support a closed source plugin uh, setup so that people could have a, a, a possible way to, um, to monetize plugins, maybe, right? So if you don't want to share your code with everyone, because a plugin is really just the code. It, there's no compiled classes inside of a plugin zip file it gets compiled at, at the same time as your application code. But a, a jar file um, is, you can obfuscate it. Of course, Groovy's gonna get messed up if you do that, but you know, it, it's, less, it's less easy to, to steal your IP, right? Um, I, I don't think there's really any performance benefits. It's really more of a hiding benefit. Um, there aren't many out there. 
I think the only one out there, the only official one out there is my um, uh, login plugin. The, um, it's not Log4j, it's um, Logback. Jesus, I don't know the name of my friggin' plugins. <laughs> um, I haven't slept much. I'm still jet lagged, I guess. Um, Logback, I thought, would be better as a binary plugin because I thought that it could uninstall a plugin, the, the Log4j plugin. Turns out that didn't work at all. So that shouldn't be a binary plugin at all. But it, it actually doesn't work very well to publish it to the repo. I've got to manually go into the repo and move stuff around. And, um, but no, I, I don't think there's many benefits to it. It's really just more of a, a hiding thing. But maybe others have. So have, have any of you worked with binary plugins? Yeah, we haven't had much pushback. Usually, the best, the, the best indication that a feature is being used is that you get people complaining about it that it's broken in certain ways. It's certainly the case with plugins. Uh, we haven't had many complaints, so I'm assuming that means no one's using it. So, all right, I'm going to leave because we don't want to run over too much into the next talk. So, thanks. Yeah, we have a now a 40 minutes break with a surprise of some kind.